a very fine gentleman who is going to be a next uh, speaker. His name is Rahul Shukla. And I know, I, I really hate when people say that, you know, this man doesn't need an introduction and you keep on reading his resume. <laughs> but uh, this man really doesn't need an introduction. Enough has been, you know, talked about him in the local newspapers, media, including TVBJ. And he is uh, trying to make Tampa as his home. Um, he is in aerospace industry in New Jersey. His company makes part for every aeroplane, which that's the one thing which he is very proud of. Every aeroplane globally in every country carries his one part, which he manufactures. So give him a very uh, amazing round of applause. He's, he's trying to push that dream and trying to bring that industry from New Jersey to Tampa. That's one of his goals, one of the dreams which he is trying to accomplish. And that's one of the, he just closed 90,000 square feet of building in St. Pete, Seminole. I saw that building yesterday morning. I got an opportunity, amazing property. And, and believe me, this is the kind of traction we need through Thai Tampa Bay. Uh, we welcome uh, Rahul. Uh, he has a wonderful wife, uh, Meena Shukla and Akash, uh, uh, his son. They are here. So give him a round of applause and we are <laughs> waiting to hear from you. Hi, my name is uh, Rahul Shukla. I run a small manufacturing company in New Jersey. We are an old-fashioned manufacturing company with punch presses, lathes, milling machines, heat treat furnace, wire winding machines. And would you believe we do all of this in New Jersey? I have lived in New Jersey for 45 years. Uh, everyone tells me, why do you live in New Jersey? <laughs> and I tell them that someone has to live in New Jersey and I'm doing my part. <laughs> now, before I go any further, I want to tell you that I have been allotted 15 minutes. That is always a challenge. I talk a lot. If you ask me the time of the day, I speak for 16 minutes. If you ask me my wife's name, I speak for 20 minutes. <laughs> Reminds me of a story my uncle used to say. He said that at a political rally, a speaker went on and on and on, and audience, one after another, they were leaving. Finally, there was only one person left in the audience. So as the speaker concluded his speech, he turns to this one last person in the audience and said, you must have found my speech very stimulating. So the guy says, not really, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so today, today I have asked my lovely wife, Mina to wave a red flag at precisely 15 minutes. My company, SS White, is a small manufacturing company, but it is also one of the oldest manufacturing companies in the United States. Compared to some other business leader you will meet today, we are hardly a drop in the bucket. Our annual sales is $28 million. Our headquarters is in New Jersey, and subsidiaries in England and India. We design and manufacture aerospace flexible shafts. Our product is used on 95% of each and every aeroplane, helicopter, fighter jets, and business jets in the world. Of course, a 747 costs $353 million, and our part is only $800, but we still brag about it. We have a subsidiary called Shukla Medical. We make extraction tools for orthopedic implants. When you get a new knee joint, a hip joint, all of them have a fixed amount of life. After 15 years, the hip joint might break. After 20 years, a knee joint may need to be replaced. To my great surprise and joy, there are many companies that make tools to put the implants in. But there weren't many companies that made the tools to take the implants out. 
So my company, Shukla Medical, specializes in making set of tools that are specifically designed to take the implants out. We also make automotive parts, uh, but those we make it in our India plant and bring them here. We make a part that makes your power seat move in and out, up and down. Uh, half of all the cars in the United States use my flexible shaft in moving the power seat. If your power seat is working correctly, you have my part. <laughs> if there's any problem at all, it's made by the other guy. <laughs> SS White, the name of my company, was founded in 1844. That is right, 1844. That was before Abraham Lincoln became president and before Jasik Irani fought the British in India. By 1960, though, the company had seen its better days and it was in a huge decline. By the time I took a job at SS White, it was only an $8 million division of a very large corporation. In 1973, I took a job at SS White as a second shift quality inspector. And in 1988, I ended up buying that company. This, ladies and gentlemen, this, ladies and gentlemen, can happen only in America. Today, I run two manufacturing companies in the USA one in England and one in India. Many say that Indians are born with business skills. Let me tell you a short story. At a New Jersey lower school, a second grade teacher once asked her students, boys and girls, tell me who was the greatest man ever born on the face of the earth. If you give me a right answer, I will give you a prize of $10. So Liam, an Irish kid, raised his hand and said, teacher, that would be St. Patrick. So the teacher said, no, that is not the right answer. No prize for you, Liam. So then Joshua, a Jewish kid, raised his hand. And he said, that would be Prophet David. No, the teacher shook her hand. He says, Joshua, that is not the right answer. No prize for you. Then little Sanjay raises his hand. And teacher says, Sanjay, who is the greatest man ever? And little Sanjay says, that would be Jesus Christ. Wow, teacher said, that is the right answer. Come on over and take your prize. And as little Sanjay was collecting his prize, the teacher said, Sanjay, I am surprised. You are a Hindu boy. You still knew that Jesus Christ was the greatest man ever? So as he took the $10 bill from teacher's hand, little Sanjay said, teacher, in my heart I know it is Lord Krishna, but business is business. <laughs> Well, well, business does come naturally to many people from India, but not to me. My father was a renowned journalist in Gujarat. He was a writer, poet, and a painter. I too started writing fiction at an early age. My stories are still today regularly published in Gujarati magazines. I love cinematography. As a matter of fact, many years ago, I wanted to go to Hollywood and uh, be part of the Hollywood movies. My wife, Mina, pleaded with, with, with me. She says, if you go to Hollywood, please stay behind the camera, she said. <laughs> I said, I want to direct, like Woody Allen or uh, like Francis Ford Coppola, uh, but as a uh, Many of you must have noticed that uh, no new movies have a name 
for director as Rahul Shukla. So that whole plan hasn't worked out. And I run an engineering company. But to become a businessman was not an easy thing for me. A lot of people have that skill, that natural inclination. I had such difficulty, and that is what I want to briefly talk about. First, I want to tell you how I started my job at SS White. In 1973, I had just finished my master's degree in industrial engineering, and I was doing my PhD. And then I ran out of money in a serious, serious way. So I had to quit my PhD, and I started looking for a job. Engineering jobs were hard to come by. I applied as a quality control inspector's job. And then I went to a nearby company, Midland Ross. Well, halfway through the interview, the guy said, what is your education? And I said, I have a master's degree in industrial engineering. And he says, the interview is over. I'm not going to hire you. You are way overqualified. So when I went home and I told my roommate, I said, they did not hire me. He says, what did you tell them? I said, I told them I have a master's degree. He said, you dumbass. I mean, he, he used a stronger word. <laughs> he said, he says, why did you say you had a master's? Next time, just say you are a high school graduate. I said, that would be a lie. He said, no, it isn't. He asked me, are you a high school graduate? I said, yes. But, he says, no but. He says, forget the but. When you say you are a high school graduate, you are not telling a lie. <laughs> now, I knew my friend was using kind of logic that Bill Clinton uses. But, but there is a saying in Sanskrit which says, Bubhukshitaha kim na karoti papam, which roughly translates that a hungry man's sins are sometimes forgiven by God. So I asked for forgiveness from God, and I applied for quality inspector's job in second shift at SS White. In the application form where it asked high school graduate, I said yes, and then I forgot to fill rest of the boxes. <laughs> During the interview, the QC manager liked my handwritings. He had no idea I had a master's degree in industrial engineering. I was university first in Gujarat University when I got my mechanical engineering degree. All he cared for was, he said, you have good handwritings, you are hired. <laughs> so at work, I checked samples for eight hours a day and I would record the results. But I wanted to do so much more. I had just learned advanced statistical techniques in analyzing data in my masters. So from my meager wage of $2.45 per hour, and as broke as I was, I purchased a simple calculator for $49. My shift started at 3.30 in the afternoon, but I would go in at 2.30. Since no one had authorized overtime, I would not punch in my card at 2.30. From 2.30 to 3.30, I would take previous day's uh, test results, and I would do histogram and X bar R chart and uh, all statistical analysis, and I would leave the report in my boss's mailbox. So one day he came to see me. He said, you leave this report in my mailbox, I don't need them. I said, boss, it is not costing you a penny. I don't punch in until 3.30, it is my time. And uh, he says, okay, you can do it if you want, but I think you are wasting your time. Well, a month later, one day, I could not go in at 2.30. So I could not do the report that day. So next day, my boss came to my inspection station. He said, where is my report? <laughs> I said, boss, I thought you did not like it. 
He said, yeah, but I started sending it to my bosses. <laughs> and they really like it. <laughs> then he said, listen, I have to tell you two things. He put his arm around me and he said, number one, he said, start punching your card at 2.30. He said, I can't use your report and not pay you. And he says, number two, he said, these high schools in India must be very good. <laughs> he, said, he said, we don't teach this way into college. <laughs> the next week, he gave me a raise of 25 cents. Two weeks later, he brought me in the first shift. A month later, he made me a senior inspector. And two months later, he called me in, my office, in his office and he said, you are my best inspector. I can use three more people like you, but I am going to recommend to the chief engineer that he should hire you in engineering. He said, I'll really miss you, but what is right is right. And that is the kind, that is the kind of kindness of good people that I have benefited from all my life. I always worked long hours, never asked for a raise, and always looked after the company's best interest. I have believed that when you do the right things, the right result will follow. Not always promptly, but always eventually. There is a Hindi song which says, Bhagwan ke ghar der hai, andher nahi hai, which translates that God's justice sometimes is delayed, but always delivered in the end. In those days, I was a prankster, very mischievous, but I always worked my ass off. <laughs> My principle was I would do whatever my boss wanted me to do. If he had asked me to go wash his car in the parking lot, I would not have said no. If I did not like it, I would gently and quietly look for another job. But otherwise, I would not say no except for three things. I would say no to something that is illegal, I would say no to something that is unethical, and I would say no to something that is unsafe. Other than that, I will do everything my boss wanted me to do. And, and I would do it with a smile. That strategy worked for me. I hardly lasted one year in any new job before I got promoted to something else. After 10 years, I became head of research in my small company. But I did not know how to think like an entrepreneur. I was an engineer, and that is how I thought. I had this tendency to overanalyze everything. I could not make a decision until 100% of all the information was in. And as you successful entrepreneurs know, that is not the right way to become successful. Also, I had an obsession to make sure I do not make mistakes. For instance, in the 70s, if I had to buy a damn toaster, I would do so much research my wife would say, what the hell are you doing? I would read consumers' reports and go to the library and, and find the best toaster. <laughs> I would say to Mina, I said, you know, GE has only seven settings for darkness of the toast. Hamilton has nine, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and I would want to find the very best price. I could not pay one more dollar. <laughs> but it wasn't about money. The real problem was my deep-rooted inferiority complex. That if I found out that I paid one more dollar for this toaster, I would say, 
I am obviously not a smart person. So then someone told me a story, told me, he says, Rahul, you don't need to get the best deal on everything. He says, uh, he says when you make a purchasing decision, when you, it is not a test of your intelligence. Uh, so I realized that when I negotiate a deal with a customer, with a bank, with a union, it does not have to be the very best deal possible. It just has to be a deal that is beneficial to me. I do not, I do not have to be better than everyone else. I just have to be slightly better than the person I'm competing against. Have you heard this story about an American and a Russian who were visiting the state of Gujarat? to establish new joint ventures. They were both near the town of Junagadh. One day they were walking on the outskirt of the city, searching for some industrial sites, and they took one wrong turn and oh my God, they were in the middle of the jungle of Gir. Suddenly, they heard a roar of a lion. They looked ahead and 500 feet Staring right at both of them with his vicious, hungry eyes was a huge lion. The lion had already taken an attack position. Both Russian and American froze with deathly fear. But then the American quickly opened his briefcase and he got his running shoes out and started putting them on. The Russian started laughing at the American. He says, hey, buddy. He says, the lion can run at 50 miles per hour. You with your fancy running shoes are not going to outrun the lion. So the American, as he's tying his shoelaces, looks at the Russian and says, I don't have to outrun the lion. I have to outrun you. <laughs> So, so, so stories like this were slowly making impression on me. I was also learning to, analyze, to stop overanalyzing and start taking action. Let me ask you uh, this question. Five frogs are sitting on a big rock in a pond. Four decide to jump off into the pond. How many frogs are left on the rock? Five. Why? Because there is a big difference between deciding and doing. <laughs> the second story, my friend and a great comedian in state of Gujarat, Shahbuddin Rathod, he told me, he said, Rahul, Someone asked me, this was in India, he said, I'm thinking about going to America. How much does it cost? So Shahbuddin says to that guy, not a penny. He said, thinking about going to America is completely free. <laughs> he says, expenses will start happening when you actually go. So making a goal itself is not enough. I read somewhere how to tell a part between a goal and a fantasy. Let me ask you this. If I say, I want to learn to speak Spanish, is that a goal or a fantasy? If I say, I want to have dinner with Madhuri Dixit and then give her a hug, is that a goal or a fantasy? If I say I want to increase my profits by 10%, is that a goal or a fantasy? You know, it took me many years to realize that all of them were fantasies. Why? Because goal has to have a deadline. I realized that fantasy with a deadline becomes a goal. If I say I want to give a hug to Madhuri Dixit by year 2018, that's a goal. <laughs> <laughs> and as 
uh, Dr. Patel said this morning, he said his goal was to go in business by 1986. His goal about increasing his profit was also connected with a deadline. And that is why I realized that to fantasize is not a bad thing. I can fantasize about buying a private jet, but I should put a deadline to it. So for me, uh, buying my company SS White, it began with a fantasy. I used to tell Mina, wow, wouldn't it be nice if we owned this company? Uh, then I found out that an investment company had signed a letter of intent. I went home that night and I said to Mina, I said, they are selling SS White for only $6 million. She said, we have $6,000. I said, we are almost there. I said, the significant digit is right. The stupid zeros will work it out, I said. <laughs> At work, I gathered three of my close friends, Tom, Bernie, and Mike, and I said with so much confidence, I said, we should buy this company. So Tom laughed at me, and he said, why would they sell it to us? I said, Tom, why do beautiful women marry ugly men? Tom says, I don't know. I said, because ugly men have the courage. <laughs> I said, Tom, are you good looking? He said, no. I said, neither am I. I said, this is our turn now. So then it took me nine months to prepare business plan after business plan. I am a perennially optimistic person. And uh, I, uh, I prepared many business plans, met with many bankers. And then, while everybody else was thinking I was a complete jerk for thinking about buying it and go to a bank and say, give me $6 million, Midlantic Bank in New Jersey gave me $6 million in 1988. I ended up buying this legendary company. The first change I made was to hire only very bright people. For a small company, we give candidates two hour long logic test. We look for four main qualities. Analytical approach, no, integrity, analytical approach, academic superiority, and sense of humor. Today, we are still a small company, but our engineers are recognized as top experts worldwide in our field. By the way, we were looking to move our entire operation to Tampa. <laughs> Two months ago, we even ended up buying a beautiful 90,000 square feet building in St. Petersburg. But since then, we have run into some internal difficulties at our New Jersey plant. Also, we are still negotiating with state of Florida about uh, the uh, incentives. Therefore, uh, my official answer is no comment. <laughs> I have many more stories to tell, but for that we will have to ask Kunal and his colleagues to ask me to come back again uh, for one of your monthly meetings. I see my wife is raising a red flag. Uh, I will end this by telling one story about my wife. She is a tough cookie. The other day she said, Rahul, you are so analytical, so smart. So good looking. I said, Meena, honey, I wish I could say the same things about you. She said, Rahul, sweetheart, you can if you lie like me. <laughs> so with that, thank you for giving me an opportunity to tell you my story. Thank you very much.